Production and broadcast of That Speech Blanket Babylon on KQED was made possible in part by a grant from MJB Coffee for nearly 100 years bringing Colombian coffee to the people of the West and by a grant from the Fred Gellert Foundation. Additional funding was provided by the members of KQED. Beach Bank of Babylon is screaming insanity for about an hour and a half. Just when you think, I can't quite believe I just saw what I think I saw, it's gone. Beach Blanket has been a party for everybody. Beach Blanket Babylon is one great entrance after another. A wild and wacky show called Beach Blanket Babylon opened in San Francisco. There was lots of dancing, lots of singing, and lots of crazy costumes, and it took the town by storm, playing year after year to sold-out houses. Throughout its record-breaking run, there was one smash version after another. There was Beach Blanket Babylon Goes Bananas, Beach Blanket Babylon goes to the star. I'm picking up good vibrations. Goes to the beach. My little town blue. Goes to Broadway. Goes to the White House. at Beach Blanket Babylon seem to have only one thing on their mind. I thought I really need to get someone to love. I'm Dorothy Gale from San Francisco, and I'm looking for love. And I'm looking for my prince. How do you know your true love is true? I don't think I'll find anyone to love in Italy. And I still haven't found my prince. Baby, baby. Blanket characters get down on their knees for love. He's not the man. Some even shout for love before. Here is my story, the sad but true. And everyone has a love story to tell. She was a beauty named Grandpa Suzanne. <laughs> the bad thing is I am not over her yet. <laughs> began almost by accident in a city where anything's possible with a man named Steve Silver. One night a bunch of us were out at dinner and we came outside the restaurant and there was a guitar player and people were throwing coins at him and I said, hey, wait a minute, let's go back to my house, put some costumes on that I had from Renapri and come back and do an act, see if we can make some, some money. So we went to my house, got the costumes on, came back, wrote the show from my house to the restaurant, and uh, we started singing Close to You by the Carpenters and some really crazy stuff, and people started throwing us money. We made 25 bucks. So we decided, let's 
see if we can make enough money to go down and play Hollywood and Vine. And we called the group Tommy Hale, and it was an inspiration. We some nights have 300 people standing on the street corner throwing us money. And that was when I really started understanding what people wanted, what kind of entertainment people wanted. And that's when I decided that I would leave the street and do something totally different. And that's when I decided I would do Beach Blanket Babylon, a conglomeration of crazy costumes, incongruities, songs, and terrific entertainers. In the early days, the band was dressed as French poodles. And uh, this is one of the things that at first I thought I wasn't going to like at all. This was what I wore for two years. And this was on my head. I would conduct like this. You know, you do cutoffs like that. We really became characters. Uh, the audience always pointed out the poodles, and uh, we, all, we felt like we were performers on stage as much as anybody else. Nancy Blyweiss was a very special talent. She was hysterical. She, um, we, I'd, known, I'd known Nancy for years, and she had a trick voice and a very special quality with timing. She had these huge eyes, and uh, she was wonderful. She was electric with an audience. San Francisco really did take us under their wing. We became sort of the property of San Francisco. We could do no wrong. And so it's a wonderful thing to become, to be a homegrown product and to watch success, the success story. And that's really what Beach Blanket is. The audience reaction to what we were doing was phenomenal. There were times when there was a gentleman from the audience once at, when we were at Olympus who came up to me and said, you know, I was contemplating suicide and my friends made me come to the show and seeing you made me realize that life was worth living. That's a tremendous responsibility, but at the same time, he became one of my, our biggest fans and he came to the show like 50, 60 times and that was nothing unusual for people to come back that many times. I've seen each one of the different variations several times. Every time a friend comes in from out of town, this is the place to take them because it symbolizes San Francisco and it's better than Valium and alcohol. And this is our big night out. We put money in a fund all year long and this is it. I think it's classic San Francisco kind of camp. And they ask us all the time, when can we go again? In fact, they say, Mommy, are we busy tonight? Can we go to Beach Blanket tonight? It's just exciting. You no, know, you forget how old you are. You forget how fat you are. You just love it. I've been here about 10, 15 times. Since 1979, almost 80 times. I guess about 100 times over the last nine years. I lost count after about 85 times, so I think I'm, I'm probably pushing 100. 450 time, times just the other day. The chief of protocol of San Francisco. We suppose this as chief of protocol, it's my obligation to show our guests and re visitors the best things we have in San Francisco. And I think that's one of the best things we have. I never let anybody get out of this town that I'm responsible for without seeing Beach Blanket. <laughs> Whatever. 
smoke, some hula girls dropping off the cliff. Hey, wait a minute. How about little hula girls that you put in the back of cars that, sh that wiggle? You're not serious. I'm serious. We go through lots of times in those preview weeks enormous changes from night to night. And that's one of the things that's incredible about the cast. They will go on stage, literally on stage, in a costume they have just gotten that moment. They have never worn it, never rehearsed it, never even seen it. What I want is I want the... There are times when I don't want to ever see another sequence. You know, you'll take your wallet out of your pocket and a sequence will fall out on the counter. Or you'll take groceries out of the bag when you get home from shopping and sequence will fall out of a bag of lettuce. They take over your life. These are going to be wonderful. I love to create a show. I love to draw the costumes. And I create really through my drawing pad. And I put something on stage that I think is dynamite. There's no way this thing is not going to work. I put it on stage. The first night, it gets no reaction. The second night, it's in storage. I love editing because when I start an idea or a concept, I think of every wild idea I can think of and anyone else who wants to put energy into it. Let's have no boundaries. Let's just create and have a great time. What do you think about her coming out with... Uh a big volcano on her head. <laughs> that you, would you laugh. How could we get this sicker? We're topless for this number, right? You are. Thank you. No, oh, the hair covers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not yeah. a bad idea. <laughs> when I say, let's get sicker, if I say an idea or somebody else says an idea and we all laugh, we know it's pretty sick. I mean, you know, if you knew sushi, if you knew sushi like I knew sushi, you know, not a stock idea, you know, but kind of sick. Uh, your imagination go wild. It, it's like uh, if you want a table to dance or if you want a tree to dance or if you want uh, anything you want is, is there as long as it gets a laugh. <laughs> the dancing is not the, the important part of the show. You know, the entertainment is the important part of the show. So it's been, it's been a real challenge for me to say, okay, dance steps don't work here, but the humor of the dancing will work. I was dancing in the Christmas tree. <laughs> and we were coming around, and what happened? Oh, so we're doing the tap number and carrying on, boom, 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 carrying on, whatnot. And all of a sudden, because I was like, my arms were locked, locked up in this part of the costume, I had no control of what was going on with the lower part. So I was wiggling around from here to there, and da 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 carrying on. And all of a sudden, I noticed my tights were coming down, slowly but surely. And they were coming down and down and down and down and down. And then before I knew it, they were down around my ankles. <laughs> what can I do? The audience was looking at me going, oh!
He congratulated Frank. He was everywhere in town where there was a beach blanket story. Steve Silver has helped me in many regards of many events that we have put on. Uh, one of the last ones, or a, a recent one, uh, was a visit of Queen Elizabeth. Uh, the show ended up with a finale, which you know, Beach Blanket ends up with a wonderful San Francisco hat that uh, the Transamerica building uh, lights up and rises up and, uh, as if magic. And so that hat was there, but then the one that really, uh, Prince Philip really uh, almost fell off the balcony uh, laughing was the, a hat that was for England, and it was the uh, Great Ben, and it opened up, and there were pictures of the Queen Mother and the Queen and the Prince, and uh, it was uh, a surprise to everybody. And that's what Steve Silver does for people. He creates surprises, even if it's for the Queen of England. In the beginning days, I did all the hats. I would design them, and then I would make them. And I, I don't know how to sew. I just kind of glued it all together and stuck things in styrofoam and prayed, crossed my fingers. And in the beginning days, there were no back braces. And Nancy Blyweiss actually balanced these hats on her head. It really was incredible. I dreaded wearing the Christmas tree hat every year. It was very large, it was very cumbersome, and it was extremely heavy, and I did not have a back brace. And it had this wonderful hair that went up the side. And so every Christmas I would come out and I would pose. And this one particular Christmas, the hat also plugged in. They plugged me in and I was standing there and everyone was going, why doesn't she start? And I'm going, I can't, I'm being electrocuted. I can't move. And finally, about 30 seconds into my shocking experience, somebody figured that something's wrong here and they unplugged me. But it was uh, one of the fun things about being in show business. the hats were pinned into the girl's hair and um, none of them were quite as large as the monsters that Steve decided to do when I started working. Also the hats had to be held a lot more securely because they were mechanical devices. They couldn't be wobbling while they were moving so uh, we came up with a, um, a back brace that was um, like a post that went down behind the girl's head all the way to her waist with uh, metal shoulder straps and a, a, a banding system of straps that went under the arms and around the front and then from the bottom around the waist to a, a breastplate. Steve's father, um, Lou, came up with the idea of going to an orthopedic yeah. supply house to have these back braces made professionally and we've been using orthopedic back braces <laughs> for all the hats since then. Yeah. My favorite hat is always the, the last one that I've done. Um, at this point, it's the, the world hat. And this new one is at least 60 pounds. And it's got um, three motors inside of this three-foot sphere and all the wiring is inside of it. And I'm amazed that nothing gets tangled in there when it's um, turning or moving, because it has um, this fairly complicated armature. Actually, when you come out wearing really huge hats, you don't kid yourself. They're, they're making that ovation. It's the hat they're going to, you know. But when you really feel fine, it's after you've done something like You've sung some sort of very touching ballad wearing something crazy, and you got them to stop laughing and to listen to you sing, and then they give you an ovation. Now, there, that's when you just, you know, ah, feels great.
Heart. I think it has a, a different view, a different version. It has to. Uh, life goes on. Since 1975, when Beach Blanket began in this Club Fugazi Hall, the world has changed. And so the show has to change to keep going. The same as the old Lucille Ball shows at the beginning of Norman Lear. Steve is wise enough to keep up with the present. And yet, there's a zaniness and an excitement that you don't find anywhere else, and I think that's what's the heart of the show, and I think it'll always be here. <laughs> It is San Francisco. You want to get the feeling of the city and um, what it's all about. You got to see Beach Blanket. And I don't think I would let anyone I loved come to San Francisco without seeing the show. When you see it and when the finale finally comes, it's the type of show that makes you feel proud to be a part of the city. Whatever the quest, we've always ended up right back here in the magical kingdom of San Francisco.